Thanks, everyone. Um, and John, thanks a lot for that uh, introduction. I can't imagine a worse uh, and more frightening way to uh, do a talk than to be the speaker right after Josh. So please <laughs> lower your expectations. Um, and uh, But let's talk a little bit IPython in the context of a tool that we hope to uh, make it uh, Okay, let me time myself. Uh, that we hope to make a very good tool for managing the entire life cycle of a scientific idea. And so what I have here is a very toy cartoonish version of the, the kind of flow, the mental flow and the process of scientific work, which tends to, we would, we would like um, to be something where we start playing with an idea, perhaps, the, perhaps a data set, uh, perhaps some algorithms that we have in mind. Um, these days, typically, if any idea is going to pan out, um, it involves collaborating with colleagues uh, in one form or another. Um, if things really start looking promising, uh, most production work tends to be large scale, tends to involve large scale computing these days. Hopefully, as uh, uh, Josh was saying, at some point you do uh, paper.submit to journal equal science, um, and hopefully with results that are reproducible. Um, and eventually your results uh, are not retracted six months later, so they actually become part of the canon in your field, uh, and they teach uh, the next generation of scientists, and we keep cycling on, on, on that flow. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the machinery that, that we have for this kind of work today uh, imposes very unpleasant barriers between each of these steps. We tend to change, have to change tools and switch gears, which means that the flow tends to be only forward. Um, you can never go back. It's, it's difficult to iterate. It's difficult to reproduce. It's difficult to be flexible and sort of consistent. Um, and uh, uh, we, I want to present IPython, which is something that started just basically, as, an, as John mentioned, as an interactive shell, as a tool that tries to provide fluid transitions across this workflow and tries to sort of let you man be, the, be the, 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 the space in which you manage uh, kind of this, uh, your scientific thinking. And I'm going to try to do that with a couple of demos. So the IPython notebook is something that started, um, as John mentioned, that we wrote basically as a way uh, following inspiration from Mathematica, uh, which is really the system that blazed the trail on this, as a way of keeping together uh, code, figures, uh, documentation, and everything into one single environment so that we could, we could basically uh, have the modern version, the computational version of a traditional lab laboratory notebook or mathematician's kind of scratch pad. Uh, and so the notebook is a, is a web-based environment in which you can type all of the Python code that you would type at a Python prompt, but you do so in cells, and the outputs that those cells produce is saved immediately there. So for example, in here, a very simple plot from matplotlib um, goes immediately into a cell. We try to make common tasks easy. Uh, so for example, if you have to grab a chunk of code from somewhere else, such as the official um, Python tutorial, and you simply paste it, it will still run, because we, we, we strip those input prompts and all that. Um, we try to give you informative ways of looking at error messages in, in, in everyday workflow, you try to run a script that doesn't exist. We highlight things, we highlight tracebacks. We let you document, as I said, um, your, what you're doing. So you can type not only code, but text. And this is text that be uh, using Markdown, which is a very simple way of producing markup um, that allows you to do um, pr basically anything that uh, HTML can do can be done in Markdown, including um, snippets of source code in other languages. Importantly, for a community such as ours, you can include mathematical text, and it's rendered correctly thanks to the fantastic MathJax library, which is an effort funded jointly by the American Mathematical Society and the American Institute of Physics to provide uh, a JavaScript implementation of LaTeX effectively. Um, but now, because we are working in a browser and because we were so slow to get this finally functioning, as John mentioned, it took us years to get it, our platform is now is a browser, means that we get for free everything that a browser can show. So you can include not only as you work uh, plots and figures that are produced by your outputs, but now you can have the notion of objects whose representations, Python objects whose representations themselves are anything that a browser can show. So for example, in here, this is not calling matplotlib to plot something, this is, as you see, the out prompt in there indicates that this is a Python result. And it's a result 
whose representations happens to be graphical. So what we've done is we've defined, we've extended the notion of the wrapper of a Python object to be from being a string to being an entire protocol such that objects can provide other richer form representations of themselves. Um, in this case, an object can provide an, um, uh, images can, ob image objects can provide uh, graphic representations of themselves either as, as bitmaps or as uh, vector images, but not just, uh, not just static images. Since we are working in browsers, we have video, so we have uh, a, a, an object called a YouTube video to which you pass simply the, 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 the hash uh, identifier for that video, and its representation will be an embedded video frame, which actually does play. If you click on it, it the video will pull from, from, from YouTube and it will play. I'm not going to make you listen to a one hour talk, but the point is, now this is part of the document where you have math, you have code, you have results, you can have instructional materials, and all of it goes into, into one, um, can, can be kept into a single environment. Um, entire websites can be embedded. So you can, you can link other resources, and this is actually the live Wikipedia mobile page, which embeds, uh, which embeds nicely. So if I search for SciPy, that's what the Wikipedia uh, page for SciPy is. And incidentally, um, this is actually a screenshot of an old IPython session in Matplotlib that is on the main, um, on the main uh, it's a screenshot that, that is on the Wikipedia page for, um, for SciPy. You can load remote codes uh, very easily. Uh, all of us, when we're working with Matplotlib, what we tend to do to get a plot, uh, uh, to get a plot working is to go to the Matplotlib gallery, uh, scan visually for something that looks vaguely like what we're after, we click on it, this sounds interesting, and you could copy and paste, but Matplotlib provides a direct link to the source code, which is right here. So if you copy that link and simply type load, IPython, assuming SourceForge is up, which is always a tricky proposition. It just may or may not work. Well, it is up. IPython will load that code straight from SourceForge, and then you can simply execute it. And you have your example right there, which makes it very easy to begin playing, modifying with it, until you get exactly the, the, the code you want. And if you're working on a bigger monitor than this, you can just drag and drop the source link, and, uh, and, and, and it'll, it'll get loaded. So we basically try to give you Um, something that really provides sort of all the pieces for the entire, um, the entire set of, of, of machinery um, that, that, that everyday scientific work uh, includes. And m since many of our results in, in science require mathematical representations, we've added, just like we've added image forms of vi or video forms of output, there's a notion of a LaTeX representation for an object. So you can, have not only you can not only type math in the text areas, but, but objects can represent themselves um, as mathematics. So, um, in this case, uh, using LaTeX syntax, and we use, that is uh, put that plays very, very nicely with the SymPy package because it means that by loading an extension that basically wires this machinery automatically into SymPy, whenever you compute anything with SymPy, the results are nicely rendered in in, in properly uh, in properly displayed math form. So as you use SymPy for for everyday work, you're, you're actually reading mathematics and you're not reading uh, just the uh, ASCII art. Furthermore, because uh, as Josh was saying, Python is, is, is super glue, we've built into, into the system the ability to talk to other systems. In particular, uh, I'm going to illustrate it with R, but, but Stefan recently modeling uh, uh, after the, what I'm going to show, wrote an exact analog of this to, to also talk to Octave. So if you load uh, an extension that we provide, you can talk to R. Uh, I'm going to provide a very simple example. Let's suppose that you have a, a, a little data set, uh, which obviously you could do some modeling with. Uh, with Python, but for some reason you want, to, you want to use the R code to do a linear fit on that little data set. If you, if you put double percent R at the top of your cell, then right here you can simply copy and paste R code, and when you execute this cell, it will call to R, and all of the outputs, including figures from R, will be kept right in there. Furthermore, you, you were able to tell it that you want the x and y variables that you had in Python to be visible to R and that they will be passed automatically, and that when it finishes the variable x, y, coef that was uh, generated by R, I need to 
is available to you as a Python var variable. So it makes it very, very easy to basically drop the pieces of R that you need or Octave into your, into your regular workflow. Same thing with Cython. Uh, we had a lot of discussions yesterday about performance and how Cython is one of the tools that we can access, that we use in Python to speed up our workflows. So a very simple example taken from their, their documentation, if you, if you write the most uh, simple-minded integra numerical integrator that you can think, if you run this in Python, it won't be too fast, and if this happens to be performance critical for you, uh, Cython makes it fairly easy to speed it up by adding a couple of type declarations, but all, now in the, uh, in the notebook, all you have to do is put double percent Cython at the top, um, you can paste the Cython code in there, it will automatically compile it, cache it, and load, uh, load it into your namespace, and then when you, when you run, uh, you can now run a timing comparison and you'll see a factor of, I don't know, roughly 80 or 90 uh, speed up just by, just by adding a couple of type declarations uh, right in the same space. So it, we, we basically try to make that process as, as seamless as possible. 10 minutes, okay. Once, once you, as, as I was saying, once you go from being, uh, from, from having an idea that seems to work for you, at some point you will want to collaborate. And one of the ways in which you can collaborate these days is on the internet. So someone out there uh, recently wrote this little, um, this little app on the Google App Engine called Notebook Cloud, which allows you to log in with your Amazon credentials and your uh, Google account into this particular panel and lets you start an Amazon, an Amazon instance, it will launch it for you and it'll take, I'm not going to wait for it to launch because basically it will give us exactly uh, the same notebook screen that I had, but this will be now running on Amazon. You log into it and you'll be logging into uh, an instance of a virtual machine that has all of the scientific Python libraries preloaded for you and a notebook ready to start. Um, and when you're done with it, you can shut it down. Uh, you decide which, which type of instance, how powerful do you want it to be, so you can do your testing on a micro one, which is very cheap and free for the first year, and then start again the same, the same thing on one of their super, uh, on one of their Death Star ones that cost $2.50 $2 an hour, uh, but that are, that are very fast. And, and you'll be running the exact same code because it's the same exact AMI, simply running uh, on a different type of uh, hardware specification from Amazon, okay? So right now it's booting. This link eventually will turn, this will turn into serving, and it'll become a link you click on it and you log into it. So that, once you can, and, and ha once it's running there, you can invite a colleague and the two of you can be working in the same notebook, collaborating and doing your work in some, in some, with some, something akin to, say, um, Google Docs, but with the actual execution of, uh, of code. We don't have real-time synchronization, but, uh, uh, but the, the basic idea does work. And this leads us to the notion, now that, we can now that we can freeze dovetailing into what Josh was saying and one of the questions about reproducibility, now that we can freeze on Amazon and put up there an entire I image that has all the code and all the data uh, related to a paper, it leads us to the possibility of truly reproducible computational work, uh, Titus Brown, who is uh, very well known in the Python community and the scientific Python community, beat us to the punch with the first paper that came out as an Amazon uh, Python AMI to, to, uh, glued together with, a Python, with an IPython notebook with this paper. Um, on, on genomic analysis, and if you, um, if you are interested in it, you can click in here and you will get the Git repo for the data, the link to the Amazon image, and the, um, and the uh, IPython notebooks to execute the code. A few weeks after that, uh, at a workshop in Boulder, we did the exact same thing, and uh, with, uh, with some colleagues from CU Boulder, and what we did was simply put up in here the information to configure a project from MIT called Star Cluster by the fantastic Justin Riley that uh, allows you to deploy not only one Amazon AMI but an entire cluster of Amazon AMIs that boot up as an IPython cluster with the head node already running as an IPython notebook. Um, and so anyone who wants to reproduce the results of this particular paper, all they have to do is copy that bit into their uh, Star Cluster configuration, type Star Cluster start, they, they will pay for the, for the run and they will be um, executing the paper. So I think we do have finally a way of actually saying, if you don't believe what I ran, run it yourself, tweak the parameters and, and see what you get. And finally, um, uh, at some point you will want to hopefully publish something. So this is an example of a notebook that I wrote recently as a, as a chapter to, for, for a book introducing just the, the generic Python ecosystem. Uh, 
the scientific Python ecosystem. So it's, there's text, there's links, there's some math, there's some plots, kind of the, exactly the kinds of things that I was showing you a minute ago. But what I want to show you is that from this notebook, we can go to this uh, PDF produced by PDF LaTeX automatically. So there's not a single line of hand editing. This is strictly converted from the notebook, from the IPYNB file, running a converter, uh, produces, the, produces the text that then gets compiled into this with blocks, with code, with figures, etc. So we have a way... <laughs> so hopefully the code... Those of you who burst into spontaneous applause, uh, I would love to see you at the sprints because the code that does this hasn't been merged into IPython yet because I've been just hacking it on the weekends as I need to get it working. But we really want this code to be finished. Uh, and I'm going to try to uh, get it finished this weekend uh, during the sprints. It's one of our priorities. So if anyone here is interested in helping with that, um, please, uh, time five, thanks. It'll be, it'll be perfect. Um, please um, give us a hand. Uh, it's easy code. You don't have to know anything about IPython. It's pure document formatting. It's decoupled from the machinery of IPython. And it is very high value. It's something that we all really, really need. Because the same code converts notebooks to uh, restructured text, markdown, HTML, LaTeX, PDF, etc. So hopefully those demos um, do go to kind of the idea that IPython provides an environment for managing this, this workflow. Um, importantly, um, the notebook format that produced that PDF file that I showed you um, is, is an important part of this, of, of this entire puzzle, and uh, it's something where we want your feedback. Uh, the format is very version control friendly. It's JSON. Um, it's made to be easy to machine process, but human fixable. If you need to fix something in there, you can edit it, and this is critically important. Um, there's lots of hooks in there to, uh, to um, annotate with metadata what you're working so that you can do other kinds of analysis in the future about it. And we really would like this to, be, to become a, the format in which we exchange computational work. Um, uh, so please give us feedback. Uh, let us know what, what is or isn't a good idea there because we, we would like this to become something important. And uh, up until now, I've shown the notebook, uh, which is really something that does have us all very excited. Um, but for us, it's... The, it's important to keep in mind that the notebook is just the tip of a spear whose body is really, really big. The body of that spear is eight, 10 years of work on the IPython infrastructure, which is a design for interactive and distributed computing around Python with, uh, with, and I don't have time to go into the details, but the point is that this architecture lets us offer not only the, something like the notebook, in fact, the notebook itself is a very small fraction of the total code, um, it lets us offer the classic shells that you've seen before, um, modern shells based on, on, on the Qt toolkit that look, have the feel of a terminal, but provide a richer, more modern environment, including um, syntax highlighting and plots, the notebook that you just saw, these are clients that we provide, a parallel computing architecture that unfortunately I don't have time to go into, but that Josh also mentioned briefly. Uh, we did talk about it in this in detail at the tutorial. Uh, but furthermore, because all these things are kind of documented and, and have a reasonably solid architecture, there's an external ecosystem that is growing around this. So Microsoft now has a plugin uh, that provides an IPython shell for the Visual Studio. Um, a Berkeley student wrote a Vim client that controls an IPython kernel uh, from within Vim, um, uh, Microsoft is now supporting in their kind of reboot of the Azure platform the deployment of notebooks on their platform. Um, Star Cluster, the project that I mentioned to you guys, gives you basically a single config file way of, with one command, deploying clusters on EC2. The um, the notebook uh, cloud, uh, this uh, this notebook cloud app that I that I showed you was also written by someone external to us with just minimal feedback on the list. And thought now has a new uh, something new coming out in EPD8 uh, called Canopy, which is a modern development environment that includes the IPython console in here. In fact, the development of the Qt console was funded by them, and all of that work, with the, the Qt console was done by Enthought for this project, but we, we benefited from that by uh, using that, uh, that support for building the, the architecture. Somebody even built an, an Emacs client for the notebook, so if you don't like to work in a browser, you can work with an Emacs uh, with the notebook. Um, and, uh, and somebody just recently, a few days ago, built a new application that lets you work with the notebook but have the rendered views and the slide views on the side. I haven't even had a chance to, to test this. Obviously, 
to wrap this up, as you can imagine, this is not my work. This is the work of a, of a large body of people. The, those who are bold face are our core committers. The blue people are here in the room. Um, and at the top have highlighted Brian Granger, who unfortunately could not make it, but who's been kind of my partner in crime uh, in this project for a long time, uh, along with Min, uh, who was a student of Brian's initially and is now at Berkeley and is really kind of our secret weapon in, in this entire project. But Brian, unfortunately, couldn't make it, but I, uh, it's really important to highlight the, the contributions that he has made. Um, and also the support that we've received from Anthot, from Microsoft. We do have some funding right now from the DOD. Um, um, but we, haven't, we have never had much stable support for, for IPython, and we do really need it. It's, if you have ideas on how to improve the situation, please talk to me, because it's proven to be remarkably hard to convince the federal funding agencies that this is worth anything. Uh, and, we're, and we're really, we, we just don't have the resources to sort of continue working on it in a, in a systematic way. And uh, I'm going to leave this up uh, because I know that the timing is tight. Uh, there was a question about reproducibility, and so this is just a quick plug for a workshop that we're co-organizing with Randy Levesque and William Stein and others uh, that will take place at Brown um, in December at ICERM on reproducibility in computational mathematics. Uh, funding agencies will participate, uh, industry will participate, and a bunch of academic researchers. So those of you who are interested in that topic, um, please have a look at this. Uh, the URL is up there, and, and, and come over, come over. Uh, it should be an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Take a couple of questions.